I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 18 is our text today, and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's perfectly fine. Grab uh, one of the Bibles in the seats around you if you're here at our Sweetwater campus. Turn to page 1043. If you're at our Parker campus, then uh, there's Bibles on the table right at the back of the room, and just jump up right now, run, go get one of those, and turn to page 1043. You will find Luke 18 right there, and you'll be able to follow along in the text. And as always, at any of our campuses, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, you want to read God's Word and you don't have access to it, then please take one of ours with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God. We want you to read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Uh, Hey, uh, I just got to say, it's great to be back. A lot of you have asked me how the trip to Israel was, and it was an excellent trip. We did have some travel uh, adventures getting there. Uh, we, uh, we were re reunited with our luggage on day five and day six, and some are still waiting for their luggage uh, uh, after all that. So, uh, it, But you know what? It, it, was, it was still a great trip, and God met us there, and uh, Next time we go, you need to go with us. If you haven't been, uh, we'll probably plan something for uh, two to three years out because a lot of you have been asking. So uh, you might want to just uh, uh, throw your name on a Connect card and say, I want information on the next Israel trip, and we'll get you connected and informed uh, so that you could go and walk where Jesus walked as well. Hey, have you ever heard a desperate cry for help? You ever been in a place where someone was crying out for help desperately? Meralda and I were dating, and we were uh, actually on a church scavenger hunt kind of thing. And uh, we were at an intersection, stopped at a red light, when a drunk driver reared into the car next to us at high speed. Just never stopped. They were driving a VW van, uh, which is not a good thing, uh, and they hit a <laughs> Chevy Monte Carlo, knocked it through the intersection. Uh, we turned into a parking lot, jumped out, and, and the girl in the passenger seat was just yelling, screaming for help. And I ran over there, and, and, and she climbed out the window, or she was trying to climb out the window, and I pulled her out of the window, and that's when I realized her, her feet weren't really attached to her body anymore. I mean, they were, the skin was holding them there. And, uh, and I was like, oh, this isn't good. Now, the, the guy driving was crying out for help desperately, too. The, the car was starting to catch on fire, uh, but he was pinned. And uh, thankfully, first responders arrived and took care of that. But those cries for help, that desperation just echoes. Have you ever cried out desperately for help? Uh, Meralda and I had been married for four and a half years. I'd finished seminary. We were serving in Georgia, and we found out that she was pregnant. We were expecting. We were so excited. You know, we started celebrating, you know, telling everybody, grabbing name books and starting to look through them uh, right up until she started bleeding. And I started praying like I'd never prayed before, begging God for our child, uh, but we miscarried. And, and it was then in that moment of sorrow and loss and disappointment that uh, I discovered the power of wounded healers, that just people who just came out of the woodwork to encourage us and to let us know, hey, there's life beyond this. We've lost children. We had miscarriages. And, and I thought, wow, this is, this is what the community does. And it was a beautiful thing. So today we are looking at a story of desperation and the miracle that happened out of it. Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 35. And it says, As Jesus drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. By the way, that's what they did. If you were uh, disabled in any way in uh, the first century, especially in Israel, that, then you begged. That's what you did. That's how you made a living. That's how you had enough to live on. So a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? 
He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed Jesus, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Now, I want you to see that the story begins with a bold request. Have mercy on me. A bold request. Have mercy on me. I mean, you heard it. The guy found out Jesus was coming by. Verse 38, he said, he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, what's interesting is the blind man acknowledged Jesus as Messiah. When he called him son of David, he was acknowledging that he was in the kingly line of David. And of course, everyone knew the Messiah was coming from the line of David. And he's acknowledging that Jesus is the king in David's line. So he was being wise and respectful, but also stating his belief that Jesus was Messiah. And then he asked for mercy. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Now, that's different requests than what he had normally asked for, because normally as a, a man begging on the side of the road, he's going to ask for alms. Hey, can you give me something? Can, can, you, can you help me out? Can you put some money in my pouch? Can you, can you bless me that way? But um, he didn't do this. On this day, he asked for mercy. And he asked for mercy knowing that he didn't deserve mercy. I mean, he hadn't done anything to earn mercy that mercy. He just asked for it. We don't deserve God's mercy either. We don't deserve it. I mean, we haven't done anything to earn God's favor. We haven't done anything for, for God to bless us out of our, our actions. And, and, and so, you know, we don't deserve mercy. You know what we do deserve? See, I, well, I'll just put it this way. I deserve hell. Okay, I deserve hell. That's what I've earned the right to. Uh, Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. Death. And, and I know people today, they're like, well, I just don't believe that a loving God would send anybody to hell. God does not need to send you to hell. You've earned the right to go there. Right? We bought a first class ticket to hell. The wages of sin is death. That, that, that's what we get. with what we've earned. That's what we deserve. And, uh, you know, that's not what we get because the verse doesn't end with the wages of sin is death, but it goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus gave his life on the cross so that we could be forgiven, so that we could get what we don't deserve. We get heaven even though we deserve hell. So the blind beggar, even though he didn't deserve it, requested mercy. I just want you to know you can request mercy. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. Ask for mercy. If you ask Jesus to forgive you, he will forgive you. That's mercy. Now, at the same time that you can ask for it, uh, there is a key to receiving this mercy. And like the blind man, it begins by acknowledging that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. He's the Messiah. It, it, it begins by believing that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you making that commitment to surrender your life to Jesus, to follow Jesus. See, that's where the mercy flows to us. When we say, Jesus, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I need you to help me. I need you to forgive me. I need you to rescue me. So today, mercy is waiting for us. Mercy is waiting for you. If you're desperate enough to ask for it, if you're willing to make that bold request, then God will forgive you of everything you've ever done and everything you ever will do wrong. That's mercy. That's what's so cool about the gospel. By the way, if you're here and you've never confessed Jesus as Lord, then this is the, the good news for you because if you will surrender to Jesus, then all of your sins will be wiped away and heaven will be your eternal destination. You go, well, how do I do that? Well, you do that by surrendering to Jesus, by being like the blind man and calling out on Jesus to rescue you, to have mercy on you. 
and, and if you're sitting here or you're joining us online or, you know, you're at our Parker campus and you're going, I want to do that, but I don't know how, then, then see us. Right after the service, our prayer team is going to be here. They'd love to pray with you. Uh, pastors will be available. We'd love to talk with you. Uh, you've got connect cards to write down on there. We, we'd love to follow up with you. We want you to know this incredible mercy that God offers to every single person who calls on the name of the Lord. So uh, mercy is available. The blind beggar asked for mercy. And then notice the crowd's response. Be silent. Uh, Verse 39 is still one of the most upsetting verses in all of scripture to me. So the blind man's calling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And it says, and those who were in front... So there between him and the road, rebuked him, telling him to be silent. I mean, the people had gathered to see Jesus, and they knew that Jesus worked miracles, they knew that Jesus drew crowds, and they wondered if he was the Messiah. But when the blind guy starts yelling, do they grab him and go, hey, let's take the blind guy up there and see if Jesus heals him. Would that be cool? They don't do that. They just go, hey, blind guy, shut up. You're bothering us. Isn't that what they did? Be silent? I mean, no compassion, no tolerance, just cold-hearted annoyance at the guy who needs Jesus the most. I mean, what kind of people were they anyway? Maybe a lot like us. I mean, it's really easy to sit and just kind of go, oh, these people were evil, these people were bad, these people were selfish, these people, I mean, what kind of people were they? Well, how evil could they be? Well, I mean, they were focused on their own experience, which is selfish, by the way. All right, you don't have to raise your hand and confess, but you ever come into church and somebody's sitting in your seat and you get irritated? (laughs) And you're just like, that's my seat. Suddenly, it's really hard for you to be happy worshiping because somehow you can't worship because you're two rows behind or a little to the left. Some of you are like, that's why we come Saturday because I can get my seat. <laughs> I have to fight all those people at 930. I mean, they were annoyed by his yelling. Hey, we're trying to enjoy Jesus here. Can you keep it down, blind guy? I'm sure you've never been annoyed by anybody, you know, like you sit down, you got the perfect seat, and then the tallest guy in the room sits right in front of you. <laughs> You're muttering under your breath, I can really sit down. Or you got somebody who, you know, uh, loves to raise their hands and they're tall, and you're like, I just give up. I can't see anything now. These people are ruining the experience. I have to watch it on the screen on the side. I can't even look at the stage. So we get it, we, you know, we just get, we, we get annoyed. I mean, and here's the thing. They were literally preventing this man from getting to Jesus. That's what they were doing. Be quiet. Just stay silent. Leave, you know, leave Jesus alone. We want to we see him for ourselves. The mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Okay, that's why we exist. That's why we do what we do. That's why we have worship services. That's why we offer children's ministry. That's why we offer student ministry. That's why we take mission trips. That's why we do all the stuff that we do. The life groups, the Bible studies, all of it. We wanna lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's our mission. And yet, so often, we can be just like the people in this crowd with the blind guy. And we can actually get in the way of people coming to Jesus. So let me just ask you a question that I hope haunts you all week long. Just being honest. Are you an open door or an obstacle for people coming to Jesus? Are you an open door? Are you an obstacle for people coming to Jesus? Because in that crowd, I wanted there to be somebody who go, hey guys, shut up. Let's help me get this guy up to Jesus. Help me get him to the front. Nobody did that. The guy's just crying out, hoping Jesus can hear him, and of course he does, and the miracle happens, but, but in that moment, nobody was helping him. So are you helping people find the Savior, or are you unintentionally hurting the mission of Christ? You know, um, Mahatma Gandhi said, I like your Christ, 
but not your Christians. See, our world is desperate for hope, and Jesus is the only answer, and we have been entrusted with the mission by Jesus. Are we helping, or are we hurting the mission? Uh, some of you were asking me, uh, me about the Holy Land trip, and I was telling you about some of our travel woes, and uh, we missed a connecting flight on the way there. It was, uh, you know, a travel disaster and all that kind of stuff. And so on the way home, my prayer was, God, help us to make these connecting flights, because there were some places where we didn't have a lot of time in airports. And so we're flying from Tel Aviv to Frankfurt. We've got one hour to catch our, our plane, and thankfully, it was only six gates away, so I was like, breathing easy. Like, we're going to make this. All we got to do is land and just walk right there. Boom, we're there. We have some people who are having trouble getting around. We didn't arrange wheelchairs or anything for them because it's only six gates away. So we land in Frankfurt. It's in Germany, in case you didn't know. Uh, and they don't let us go six gates to the left. They make us walk a half a mile the other direction and tell us to go through security again. And the security line is way backed up, and right now we've got like 10 minutes before they start boarding our flight to the United States. And uh, I found this guy who was ahead of uh, the security thing, and he takes us to another security place and lets us cut the line, and we get through. But we get through, but then they start searching, I don't know how to put this, all of our little old ladies, because <laughs> they look like terrorists. You know, and, uh, and they're going through, I, I kid you not, half of them got searched, uh, their bags and all this stuff. And I'm going, we just got off a plane from Israel, the safest country in the world. And they're searching our stuff. And, and we barely made that plane. But as I'm standing there, just kind of stewing in uh, watching them search 80-year-olds for bombs, uh, I realized that they were not helping us get where we needed to go. I mean, they're in an airport. You'd think their, their job would be to help you get from a gate that you're, you just landed at to the gate you need to get to for your plane. You'd think that, that they would do that well, but it seemed like they were doing everything they could to prevent us from getting where we needed to go. And the Holy Spirit just whispered to me, that's what churches do to people who want to find Jesus. People want to find Jesus. People are desperate for hope. People need good news. People know that they need forgiveness and they want to find life and meaning and they come into churches and a lot of times churches want to burden them with rules and want to say, well, you have to do this and you have to go here and you can't dress like that and you got to change this and, and it just gets in the way of the grace of God. So are we helping people get to Jesus or are we hurting the mission of Christ? It really boils down to two questions. First one is, how do you treat people? I mean, how, do you, how are you treating people? Because the Apostle Paul says, love is patient and love is kind. Are you? Are you patient? Are you kind? Love blesses people. Do you? I mean, do you, I just got, how do you treat the servers in the restaurants? even when they get your order wrong twice. Like, I mean, how do you treat them? Are you, are you helping them get to Jesus or are you getting in the way? How do you treat the staff in the doctor's office? I know you're there and you don't feel good and I know they're making you wait because they don't know how to tell time and I know all that stuff, but, but how are you treating them? Are you helping them get to Jesus or are you getting in the way? I mean, how do you treat the police officer when he pulls you over? How do you teach, treat the teacher when your child's not doing well in school? How do you treat the, your own family? Are you helping them get to Jesus or are you sending them the wrong direction? See, the way we treat people is either an open door or an obstacle for people coming to Jesus. Second question, how do you represent Jesus? How do you represent Jesus? Because the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 says that we are ambassadors for Christ. 
We're ambassadors. You know what ambassadors do? They represent the one that sent them. So Jesus sent us. If you're a follower of Jesus, then Jesus sent you, and, and now you are representing him to the world. Are you representing him well? How do you represent Jesus in your business dealings? How do you represent Jesus at your kids' sporting events? Please don't be that parent. You know, those, those, those refs aren't getting paid much, if anything. They don't need to hear it from you. How do you represent Jesus while you're driving or while you're waiting in line at Disney? How do you represent Jesus when you're discussing politics? Honestly, you know, our world is broken, it's divided, and, and especially politically. Uh, and Jesus wants to unite us in love and purpose. By the way, that's why even though I have strong political convictions, I'm not gonna share them from the pulpit, and if you wanna know what they are, you have to buy me lunch. <laughs> it's not my calling. Politics is not my calling. My calling is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's what I'm all about. So the mission of Jesus is more important than politics. Okay, that's, now that's my conviction. I want it to be your conviction. I think Jesus wants it to be your conviction. So again, don't raise hands or answer this out loud. You and the Holy Spirit just have a conversation about this. But honestly, would you rather have your candidate win or your party win and your neighbor go to hell? Or would you rather see your neighbor come to faith and lose an election? What are your values at this point of getting people to Jesus? And I know a lot of you are going, I want both. <laughs> but you gotta value one more than the other. If the mission of Jesus is not our priority, we might be those people in the crowd telling the blind guys to shut up, telling the lost people to go the wrong direction being the obstacles to people coming to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, the obstacles to a miracle. Now, the crowd told the blind guy to shut up, but the blind guy doesn't shut up. He just yells louder. I think I'd like this guy. And he yells louder, and Jesus stops, and he calls the man to him, and then he asks the grace-filled question. What do you want me to do for you? Isn't that awesome? Look at verse 41. Jesus just says, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. It's that simple. Isn't that crazy? I mean, his answer was obvious. I just wanted you to heal me. So I'm yelling. And Jesus healed him. And he followed Jesus and he praised Jesus. And so did all the people who were around him who saw it, even the people who told the guy to shut up. Because life change is exciting and life change is, is dramatic and people get jazzed about life change. So today, what do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you? See, it's a grace-filled question. Jesus asked that question and it doesn't mean that he stopped asking that question. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Now, some of you are so stubborn and so independent, your, your first reaction is, nothing, I'm good. But if Jesus asks you, what do you want me to, what do you, to do for you, then you, I'd suggest you have an answer. And there's some of you that right now, you're so desperate, you could write a book on what you want Jesus to do for you. And your life is consumed with pain and brokenness and heartache and fear and, and you're, you're desperate and you're like, I want Jesus to ask me this question and, and I'm just telling you he is because he's here. The Holy Spirit is present and listening and God's character is consistent. He still asks the grace-filled question. So how desperate are you? How desperate are you? See, because a lot of times we get desperate and, and we cry out to God and, and that's it. We just cry out. 
we stop there. Let me just ask you, are you desperate enough for God to work in your life that you would actually read your Bible? You'd actually read your Bible. Because, you know, we, we give these books away. You know why we give these books away? Because they're the words of life. I mean, they, they tell you what to believe and how to live. And we believe if you read and apply God's word, God will change your life. It's one of our core values here. That's why we say it all the time. That's why we give the books away, because we want you to read. If you read and apply God's word, God will change your life. And there's a lot of you go, well, yeah, I want God to change my life, but I don't want to read the Bible. Good luck. Are you desperate enough to say, hey, you know what? I'm actually going to pick this book up, and I'm going to read it. Even when I don't understand it, I'm going to read it. You know, if you download that YouVersion app that we advertise in our bulletin every week, you can put it on your phone or on your tablet, and you can actually read the Bible anywhere, anytime. You don't have to carry a book around. And they have reading plans on that Bible app. You can actually, like, they'll tell you to, where to read, and, and some of them have devotions with them, so you can actually understand some of the stuff that you're reading. It's kind of a really cool deal, but you actually have to say, God, I'm desperate enough that I need to hear from you, and I want to hear from you, and I'm going to do what you say. Are you desperate enough to read your Bible? Are you desperate enough to attend worship regularly? You guys are like, hey, what are you talking about? I'm, we're here. Yeah, you are here. And I appreciate the fact that you're here. But is this a priority for you or just something that you do from time to time? Because it, it's really easy to get out of the habit of being here regularly. It's really easy to put other things as priorities and kind of go, well, it's just one weekend. It's just this kind. And, and statistics say that the average I hate to use this word, faithful, regular churchgoer goes to church. You want to guess how many times a month they go to church? Less than two. Some of you are like, I am way above average. <laughs> it's the first time in my life I've been way above average. And I'm, hey, way to go. If you're way above average, praise God. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just saying, is this a priority for you? Because, you know, God shows up and changes lives and teaches things and uh, worship matters. Are you desperate enough to join a life group or, or sign up for Alpha? In about a month, we'll start having life group signups for the next session. And some of you have been meaning to join a life group forever. You keep thinking, you know, next time I'll join a life group. Next time I'll sign up for a women's Bible study. Next time they talk about Alpha, I'll take Alpha. And by the way, if you're sitting here going, well, I don't know anything about Jesus and I got a thousand questions I'm afraid to ask because then everybody will know that I don't believe like they believe, then Alpha is the course for you. They're just wrapping up a, a couple of classes on Alpha right now and, and they'll start again in, in January. So what are you waiting for? How desperate are you? Do you want God to work in your life? Are you desperate enough to go to Celebrate Recovery? I mean, Monday night, 6.30 in this room. You go, well, I don't know if I'm that messed up. <laughs> Trust me, you are. Uh, look, and, and the great thing about Celebrate Recovery is that they know you're messed up, but they also know how, to, how God can heal your life, how God can change your life. And you go, but I'm so stuck where I am. That's where they all were too. And they'll help you to get unstuck and follow Jesus. It, it, but you gotta be desperate enough to say, I need God to change my life. You gotta relate to that blind guy and start shouting out and saying, God, I'm gonna do something different. Are you desperate enough to go to counseling? Are you, basically, are you desperate enough to ask for help? Some of you are dying on the inside, but you haven't told anybody that you're dying. Some of you are struggling with faith and you haven't told anybody that you're struggling. Some of you, your, your life is falling apart and nobody knows it because you're still smiling and saying, I'm fine. And we're looking at a story where a guy's life was changed because he didn't shut up when everybody told him to shut up. And he cried out all the louder for Jesus to have mercy on him. And when he cried out, he got a conversation with the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that started off with, what do you want me to do for you? And that same Savior 
is asking you today, what do you want me to do for you? So how desperate are you? Last week, the message was about a man not desperate enough to do what Jesus said. It's one of the only times in scripture it says somebody left Jesus sad. See, the blind man knew his only hope was Jesus, so he went all in because Jesus can heal and Jesus can restore and Jesus can redeem and provide. Look, Jesus can change your life. Are you desperate enough to ask Jesus for help? Because if you are, God's gonna change your life. If you're desperate enough tonight and, you're, and you say, I need prayer, our prayer team's gonna be right here. It's gonna be several of them after the service willing to pray for you, willing to you know, intercede for you, willing to hear you and lift you up to God. You need to talk to a pastor, there are pastors available. We'd be glad to talk with you. If it needs more time than a few minutes, then make an appointment. We'd be glad to sit down with you. Help you process what God is doing in your life. Help you figure out how to follow Jesus. You say, well, I, I, I can't talk to anybody tonight. I, I'm, I'm in too big of a hurry. Fill out the connect cards and just say, hey, somebody call me. I need to talk to someone. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I need help. You see, don't wait. Don't put it off because you might miss the miracle of life change if you do. I hope and pray tonight, today, that you are desperate enough to ask Jesus for help. And I'm praying that you will have a conversation where Jesus gets to ask you, what do you want me to do in your life? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us and care for us. Enough to hear us when we cry out in desperation. And God, we don't ever want to be like the people in the crowd who, who told them to, just to shut up and be quiet and not care. We don't want to be the people who are obstacles to anyone finding you. So God, do a work in our lives and change us. Meet us in this place of desperation and heal us, restore us, redeem us, provide for us, uh, give us direction, show us the way. Because we can't do anything apart from you. You're the only hope for us. You're the only hope for the world. And we thank you for a love that won't let us go. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.